This is what it's all about. Coming up on Frontiers, the Kenai Fish Wars, the fight to end set netting in Cook Inlet goes to the Supreme Court next week. I don't think it's fair for any one particular group to be more entitled than another. Why can't sports fishing advocates and Cook Inlet set netters find common ground? Sponsorship for Frontiers with Rhonda McBride is provided by Kupik Corporation and Spinard Builders Supply. Alaska, where there are old triumphs, but also new frontiers. With challenges as great as the state itself, but a belief the best is yet to come. Bringing you the faces, the places, and the spirit of the last frontier. This is Frontiers with Rhonda McBride. Welcome to Frontiers. For many Alaskans, the urge to fish is almost primal. And when there's conflict over a fishery, people see red, red like a sockeye salmon. In Cook Inlet, sports fishermen and set netters have been at it for decades, fighting over their share of the salmon. Emotions ran high when set netters protested in front of the Soldatna Sports Center during the annual banquet for the Kenai River Classic, an elite sports fishing event. Now this comes less than a few days before the Alaska Supreme Court hearing on an initiative to ban set netting in Cook Inlet. And on Wednesday, another demonstration was staged on the Kenai River outside Bob Penny's home. Now, Penny is a wealthy Anchorage developer, the main architect of the ballot initiative to shut down the Cook Inlet set netters. State records show he has donated $97,000 to the Alaska Fisheries Conservation Alliance, a group formed to get the initiative passed. Now, most of the money was used to hire a consultant to collect signatures to qualify the initiative for the ballot. While set netters accuse Penny of trying to buy votes, Penny said in a statement that he is honored to be the initial source of funds for the alliance. And he says, if the Alaska Supreme Court allows the ballot to go forward next August, we can turn to others and ask for their help. Well, before we go further, let's look at some of the underlying issues that pit the set netters and the sports fishers against each other. And that includes the crash of the Kenai's world-famous King Salmon Run. Commercial set netters have worked this beach for decades. And there's hundreds of families on the peninsula alone that depend on set netting. Beaches on the east side of Cook Inlet are a good place to catch salmon because they hug the shore as the fish try to find their way back home to the Kenai River to their spawning ground. In recent years, fewer kings, or Chinooks as they're also called, have been swimming up this river. And that's caused trouble for the set netters. Although they target sockeye salmon, the kings run at the same time, and some are caught here. That's why the Alaska Fishery Conservation Alliance gathered more than 40,000 signatures to ban commercial set netting in areas like Cook Inlet. Just like a wall of death. Derek Lichlider says he joined the alliance because he wants the kings to be around for his grandchildren to catch. We're taking too much. So it's time to really set back and not take as much. We need to start being a little bit more conservative before it's too late. It's really bad policy. Jim Butler says if voters outlaw the fishery here, set netters would lose not just the value of their permits, but also their equipment. People don't fully appreciate the, the, the scope of the investment people have here. You know, it's millions and millions and millions of dollars. The initiative has loomed large on the Kenai Peninsula. Here at the Snug Harbor Fish Processing Plant, there are worries that if set netting goes away, so will a big chunk of business. There are solutions much more reasonable than a set netter ban. Paul Dale says commercial fisheries have a billion dollar plus economic footprint on the Kenai Peninsula. The very best economic conclusion for Alaska is to maintain, I think, a diverse mix of these fisheries. All right, 39.21 is your total. The sports fishing industry claims that its economic impact is at least twice as much, maybe more. If set nets are banned, the Cook Inlet Drift Net Fleet, which fishes for salmon out in the ocean, stands to gain. 
they'll be allowed to catch more sockeyes. But most don't like the initiative and see it as another Kenai fish war strategy aimed at putting commercial fishermen out of business. State Senator Peter Machicki drift nets in the summer. He believes the initiative goes against the state's constitution, which leaves allocation of fish to the state, not to voters. There's no question this is ballot box biology. Machicki says managing fisheries is very complicated, better left to the experts, who say the low king returns are likely caused by problems out in the ocean. We need to focus on the real problems and not use a single fishery as a scapegoat. The outcry against the initiative is loud in the Kenai area. The question is, how will voters weigh in statewide? If the initiative passes, it would not affect subsistence or personal use fisheries. Well, in the midst of all of this conflict, some encouraging news. The king run appears to be recovering based on what's called escapement, the number of fish that survive to spawn. State biologists say not all the data has been compiled yet, but so far it looks like 7,000 more kings made it to their spawning grounds than were counted two years ago. The Alaska Fisheries Conservation Alliance has said, Every king counts, and its president, Joe Connors, says those escapement numbers need to be higher. Connors owns a sports fishing lodge on the Kenai River near Sterling, where photojournalist Jacob Curtis and I went to learn more about what's at stake. So we're river mile 36. That's 36 miles from Cook Inlet. Ryan Tompkins teaches school in Oregon. But every summer for the past 13 years, he comes back to work as a fishing guide for the Big Sky Charter and Fish Camp. A nice change of scenery. And the extra income makes it possible for his wife to stay home with the kids. He and another guide, Angelo Brennan, also enjoy fishing for themselves. So we're fishing for silver, silver salmon. The silvers are starting to show up, but don't appear to be in this spot, so they move on. Ryan used to show up for fishing in June, but since the king numbers have dwindled, so has the work. In July, we've had to be creative. You know, there's been a few years where we just haven't even been allowed to fish for kings. So we've become trout fishermen or sockeye fishermen. And since that time, some of the smaller lodges have gone out of business, but there are still some on this stretch of river that do very well. We got a lot of Europeans, a lot of people from Germany. This summer, we've Lithuania. Visitors who spent thousands, not just on the Kenai, but elsewhere in the state. Visitors lured here by the Big Sky Fish Camp. Here's one of your cabins. What's the economic impact of this cabin to the Kenai Peninsula Borough? That's a good question. It's significant. We pay uh, property tax, we pay sales tax to the borough. Joe Connors pays the borough about $15,000 a year in taxes, and the borough just raised the valuation on his property by $80,000. Aside from the Hacienda Happy Jose, Joe Connors has eight cabins in all. Keep it up, girls. One group of guests has just come back from a trip on the river. So there are lots of sockeyes to deal with. Joe Connors runs a pretty tight operation. Next, the salmon go on display. A California hospital administrator who brought both friends and family made quite a haul. Plenty of salmon and lots of good memories. All right, baby, one, two, three. Next, Joe's crew cleans the fish and fillets them. The salmon will be frozen and sent home with the guests so they can continue to enjoy their Alaskan experience. This is Donnie Pratt, good buddy of mine. This is his father, 81 years old, first time to Alaska. It's been a dream of his life to come up and fish on the Kenai. Ron Hanners has been coming to this camp since he was a child. He tries to make it here every year. All told, I'm going to say we probably put 15 to 20,000 into the local economy. That's just for this trip. At the Soldatna Fred Myers, Hanner's group spent about $1,000 on the first day of their visit. We, we make sandwiches every day. What do we make? 10 sandwiches every day, and we got to buy all that. And of course, we, uh, we, we have a few 
um, cocktails <laughs> <laughs> while we're here. <laughs> while Hanners is happy to catch the Reds, he misses the Kings. It worries us totally for the whole fishery because that's the joy that we come up here for. I'm a retired uh, professor. Joe Connors wants to show us some of the big trophy fishes in the lodge. Each of them has a story. The biggest is named Gus. He was caught in the 80s. What do these big salmon represent as far as the uniqueness of the fishery? They make the Kenai what it is, the big the big king salmon. Nowhere in the world do you have fish like that. So if the set netters are gone, do you think we'll see kings like these again? Absolutely. Those pushing for a set net ban say the burden of conservation falls too heavily on the river, where fishing has been sharply restricted. And that's hurt the fishing lodges all along this river. I think the way the Constitution reads is that the resources belong to the people. It doesn't even say what people. It doesn't say Alaskans. It doesn't say Americans. It just says to the people. And ultimately, the next generation. Show me your fish. Yeah. Tell me what you got. Sockeye. Well, right now, I'm the third generation. Angelo Brennan is Joe Connor's grandson, so this river has been a thread throughout his life. I hope that someday this can be a five, six, seven generation family affair. Fishing and family, two passions that flow throughout this river, no matter what side of this debate you're on. Well, up next, we look at what's at stake for the Blossom family. They've been set netting on a beach near Nanilchik for four generations. Talk about fishing being in the blood. The Blossom family set nets on a beach about 10 miles north of Nanilchik. They fear the initiative, if it passes, could destroy their family's way of life forever. Photojournalist Carolyn Hall and I went to their beach during a commercial opener. Does the view here ever get old? No. Nope, I tell people when I go out on my boat in the morning. I got the best office view in the world. Actually, Doug Blossom would prefer some wind and rain to help drive the salmon into his nets. But either way, the Blossoms are ready to fish. Probably one of the first lessons you learn real quick setting nets is the tides. You know, we have the second largest tides in the world. There are also tides of change. If voters ban the set net fishery here, the life the Blossoms have loved and known could be swept away forever. I just really think it teaches young people work ethics. I know it has with my boys and daughter. The Blossoms operate 21 set nets on this beach, so it takes a lot of teamwork. And Brittany is our youngest kid. She's going to be a freshman at Sadatna High School. Doug's youngest son, Boomer, is here today. He has two other sons who also help out. Set netting put all three through college. So pretty much all still in the family. And they're all fourth generation. In a lot of ways, the Blossoms remind you of a farm family. But instead of fields, they harvest the seed. Doug's nephew, Cody, is the youngest crew member. And even though he's only 10, you can learn a lot from him about how set nets work. The nets so sort of go into a bag shape the fish go into the bag, and the web is, is the color of the water, so they cannot see it. Cody learned most of what he knows about set netting from his grandfather, Doug Sr., who died two years ago. Whenever I asked, and it was a calm day, he would take me out in the boat with him. Mm -hmm. Do you miss him? Yes. Yes, I miss him. Cody's grandfather was a little boy when his parents started set netting in 1948. As a kid, he worked hard, even into his 70s. You always try to impress Grandpa with your work ethic. Boomer's parents believe his grandfather's example gave him the discipline to get through college and play on the UAA basketball team. You know, your parents will ask you to do something, and you'll kind of procrastinate or kind of argue about it before you do it. For him, you, when he asked you to do something, you did it. 
while the crews head out for another round of fish picking. Lunch is in the works at the Blossom Summer Cabin. We're gonna do um, a stir fry. The Blossoms not only feed their own family, but other young people they've hired. Gotta try to time it so that it's done when they come in. Mary Blossom, Doug's wife, keeps an eye out for the crew. If they catch a lot of fish, it may delay their return to shore, so lunch might have to go on the back burner. But when it comes to the set net initiative, Mary feels the heat. I'm afraid, I guess. Afraid of what will happen if the set net initiative gets on the ballot. The propaganda and the politics are, are going to take over, and, um, and we will just kind of get lost. Mary's sister-in-law, Debbie, also worries. This is part of our culture and history, and there's no reason for us not to continue for the next 100 years. Setnetter opponents say their fight is all about the next 100 years to ensure King Salmon Run survive into the future. The Blossoms believe Setnetters are scapegoats caught in a web of politics. I think it would be just a real shame for Setnetting to ever go away. But Blossom says he tries not to think about that too much. I think. The stress was really tough on my dad, especially the last few years of his life. So for now, the Blossoms and their crew sit down to lunch, enjoying the food and each other. It's totally family for us. If we let our biologists manage the fishery, biological, I think there will be fish for my grandchildren and kids to come. <laughs> You've heard both sides. Is there room for compromise? Up next, the editor of the Alaska Journal of Commerce joins our conversation, and we ask him, is there an end in sight to the Kenai fish wars? Well, let's take a look back at the legal fish wars in the Setnet debate. A petition was submitted to put the ban on the ballot for the primary election in 2016, but Lieutenant Governor Mead Treadwell denied it in 2014 after a legal opinion said it violated the state constitution. The Alaska Fisheries Conservation Alliance then filed a lawsuit to challenge the decision. Then, in July of 2014, a victory for the alliance. An Anchorage Superior Court judge ruled signature gathering for a petition to ban set netting could move forward, but the state announced plans to take the fight to the Alaska Supreme Court. This June, the Alliance submitted 43,000 signatures to the Division of Elections. And earlier this month, the Lieutenant Governor's Office certified the initiative for the 2016 August primary ballot. So the next big battle comes next week. The Alaska Supreme Court is scheduled to hear those arguments this coming Wednesday. A decision on whether the initiative is legal is expected later in the year. Well, joining us now, Andrew Jensen, editor of the Alaska Journal of Commerce. And I know, Andrew, you have followed these fish fights for a long time. Can you give us a preview of what to expect uh, when the Supreme Court takes this up? Well, what we're going to see is uh, a rerun of the arguments that have already been made, essentially. Um, when Lieutenant Governor Treadwell denied it in uh, January 2014, he did it because it was uh, the, the Department of Law uh, felt that it was an uh, appropriation of resources, and that is prohibited under the Constitution. You cannot use a ballot initiative to appropriate a resource. So that was his justification for striking it down. Uh, when they went to the Sup Superior Court, the, the Fisheries Conservation Alliance, uh, their argument was that, you know, that this isn't uh, an appropriation. What we're doing is banning a gear type. And they have analogized it to um, at statehood when fish traps were outlawed and said this is no different than, than when the voters outlawed fish traps. We're simply outlawing a gear group. So the Superior Court came down on the side of the Fisheries Conservation Alliance on that. And now it's going to the Supreme Court where we're going to see these arguments play out again. Um, and so then ultimately the Supreme Court will have to make this decision um, and they'll, you know, we'll have to look at their, their case law precedent where, because they've, they've ruled several times on, on ballot initiatives that they determine to be appropriations that have been struck down from the ballot before. Or they'll let it go forward. Now, I want to talk a little bit about Bob Penny because I did ask to interview him. He declined. Uh, he said he wants to wait until after uh, the Supreme Court decision. But, you know, he seems to have a huge role in this. 
Oh yes, I mean, it, I mean, his role in Cook Inlet Fisheries, you know, goes back more than 30 years to the early early 1980s when the Kenai River Sport Fishing Association was formed, um, and he's he's made it um, a, a priority uh, of of his involvement with the fishery to really reverse the the commercial sport balance in Cook Inlet to, to shift it overwhelmingly towards recreational uh, fishing. Um, it goes back to, you know, even in 1988, speaking of fish traps, uh, Bob Penny and his group suggested putting a fish trap on the Kenai River and then paying the set netters from, from that harvest. So get rid of the set netters on the beaches, put a fish trap in the river, and then pay them from that. And then in 1995, he sponsored an initiative that would have reallocated uh, salmon uh, towards recreational users, and that was struck down uh, by the Supreme Court. And it, Ironically, also after winning at the Superior Court level. So we're here sort of in this stage again where there's another initiative backed by Bob Penny that has won at the Superior Court level that's going to be heard in front of the Supreme Court. So we just have to wait to see what happened. But let's just suppose that uh, the Supreme Court says, okay, it can go forward. Mm -hmm. This little nuance about it being a gear type and not an allocation mm -hmm. it can uh, suffice to let it go forward. Mm -hmm. So if it does, what's the biology here? If the initiative passes, will it guarantee that we'll get more kings up the Kenai River? Well, no, there's certainly no guarantees in fisheries management. Um, and that's one thing I think that if you, the way that the fishery played out this year, you saw the king salmon have their, you know, it was the best run that's been seen in probably five years. And this run was not produced from any of the years that were severely restricted in the last 2012, 2013, 2014, where the set netters and the in-river sport users were severely restricted. So we saw the king salmon rebound without having to ban the set netters. So the biology of the fish, um, and we saw we saw improvements in king salmon around the state versus the, the, the lows of the last couple years. So we, we've seen a better experience and everybody got to fish. The sport fishermen got to use bait, the set netters got some extra time, and you had an orderly fishery without too much finger pointing and yelling. And that was, and you didn't have to ban a gear group to have that happen. And so I think that uh, the biology, getting rid of the set netters is not going to magically make the king salmon return or to be back in their record now, size. One thing that people bring up is, are the early run kings, which mm. there is no set netter presence there. Mm. Uh, and they say that that's an argument that the set netters don't affect the, the king run into the Kenai. Right. I mean, and, you know, and they, have, they do have a point with that because the, the early run for kings has been closed now for several years in a row. And there hasn't been any commercial fishing on that run for, for, for decades. So the, the commercial guys will say, you know, the only people who have been fishing this run are the in-river sport guys. Um, we haven't had anything to do with it. So if, if the set netters are at fault, then how do you account for the early run? Now, one thing that Bob Penny said, and we're running out of time here, but he said that at least this will bring a dialogue regardless of what happens. And, and it may be making some changes in the set net fishery to improve king returns. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, the, the Department of Fish and Game really already has the tools, you know, and many of the, the, the management plan for Cook Inlet, as far as set netters go, has been essentially written by Bob Penny's organization, the Kenai River Sport Fish Association. The management plans that they've put to the Board of Fisheries have largely been adopted by the Board of Fisheries. So the way that the fishery was managed this year was really according to the way they want it to be managed. Um, so I think that the Fish and Game Department has the tools that they need. If they need to pull the set netters out of the water, they can do it. All right. Well, I want to thank you, Andrew mm -hmm. Jensen. We are out of time, but we're going to continue this conversation online on the Frontier section of KTVA.com. And we want to thank you for joining us. We'll explore yet another Frontier next week. We'll see you then.